I don't I don't want to comment because it it kind of hints at my <laughs> proclivities, but I've seen a an unusual rise in foot fetishes on the internet lately. <laughs> What the fuck? What, what have you been visiting? What do you look up for your nightly internet Google spree? That's why I didn't want to say it, but I had to Are say it. Are you looking up hand fetishes said. that lead you to a link to foot fetishes or something? Perhaps. This is what happens when you mix that tequila and wine. You just spell things all wrong. You know what time it is. Welcome to the Trinity Force Podcast. Optimus Tom, Resident AP, plays mid and his styles are shady. Got a syndrome, can't nerf it. You can find him in the chat, type of worth it. And that's Hornet, stuck in evil hell. Thought it was going off, once again it fell. Never spent a single dime on LOL. And if you step into his jungle, expect a brawl. All slander, mad specialist. He's precise, doesn't tolerate estimates. The man's addicted by every hero. You can tell because his bank account's stuck at zero. And last but not least, your host, Pornophobia. Picks an 80 carry, and he's on ya. He's got the full mouth, ground and pound. Don't get excited, it's not as sexy as it sounds. That's your whole team, enjoy the podcast. Put your headphones on, we'll have a blast. We'll check your email and Twitter, of course. Just don't ask us how four guys make a try for us. Thanks for listening to the Trinity Force podcast brought to you by Audible.com, your premier website for audiobook downloads. Are you interested in trying Audible? Head on over to www.audibletrial.com slash podcast to sign up for a 30-day, no-question-asked free trial of Audible. If you sign up using the aforementioned URL, you will instantly gain one free credit, which will allow you to download such books as Game of Thrones, The Hunger Games, or any Stephen King novel. Hey guys, welcome to Trinity Force Podcast, the official podcast at ggchronicle.com. This is episode number 44, and my name is Ponophobia. I am also part of ggchronicle.com. Well, I say also because I am joined by three other amazing men tonight. So, Tier, our resident 2200 ELO player, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt tonight, sir. Oh, I, I very much appreciate that. We're all about rounding up here. So anyone who's above 1,200 ELO, technically 2,200 ELO today. Congratulations, <laughs> all of you. You've increased your gameplay by that much. Ah, uh, finally. <laughs> finally, Optimus Tom has joined us. I'm not going to be taken seriously. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm taking anyone seriously, it's going to be Duroslander. I'm an enabler. I've enabled people today. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if you missed my tweets, he enabled me today. I made him make up a story for me so I can tell somebody a, a, a false truth about me. He basically what? stole my life story. He needed, a, he needed to tell a girl a reason why he's vegetarian now, so I just, <laughs> I just gave him my story. <laughs> he told oh, me that. That's really weird. It's about like what you're eating as opposed to length. I mean, those are the only... <laughs> actual lies Wait. I really worry about with women. <laughs> like, don't, this, don't this chicks dig very, vegetarians? <laughs> this goes very weird with the conversation we had prior to the, the cast going. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Send send Ponophobia $2 uh, by PayPal and we'll, we'll release the pre-podcast uh, cast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unmarked esports dollars. Yeah, somehow, no, somehow our, when we're just talking, it's more entertaining than we actually do the podcast. So <laughs> we have to like flip it, maybe. Flip, just start, just just turn on the uh, Skype call, just start talking the entire oh, time it'll, and release it'll, that as our podcast. It'll be like other shows on the internet about League of Legends that are funnier when they're not actually a show. Ooh, face. <laughs> so, we are, of course, <coughs> dying here as we talk. Uh, a League of Legends podcast and quite a bit of uh, happenings kind of took place over this last week and some about a PAX and a North region or North American regional finals. I hear Optimus Tom was there. Is this true Optimus Tom? Yeah, I mean, I didn't even know I was going to be there until like Tuesday night when all of a sudden I there was everybody decided to want me there. It was a uh, it was a little interesting. Uh, Monte Cristo was planning on going and staying with uh KDH from Area of Defect. They had uh, actually played a show at, at the uh, event. It was interesting, but uh my story of getting there is actually a little more interesting if you want me to tell that. I'm pretty sure last week we divulged how much you spent on your plane ticket. Oh last my minute. god, I can't believe I spent that much on my plane ticket. Uh, how many best... skins did you get though? Was it worth it? That's all. That's my only. Question. No, <laughs> fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> I got Wait, one. Tell, skin. Tell us, tell you us got how... skins for all of us, right? I, mean, I got. Yeah. 
I got one skin. I got no Riot Graves. I got a singular Paxona skin, which I got on, like, Thursday when Pax wasn't even open yet. And I was like, oh, I'm going to be a good big brother. I'm going to give this to my sister. My sister got all super, super happy about it. And then the rest of the weekend, I didn't get a single fucking skin. <laughs> Why didn't you just use your mouth and get the skins for free? <laughs> Listen, I don't need a mouth. <laughs> <laughs> more pre-show banter damn it i would have to release all this so people understand our jokes during the show <laughs> i really hope you don't <laughs> it might thwart his uh his future advances i'm really thinking officials. we should do like a yeah i'm really thinking we should do like a trinity force after show where we all just oh, sit God. around and talk about tequila and wine and how sotir thinks that 14 under elo is the easiest thing in the world <laughs> but yeah. i don't drink adam <laughs> we're gonna have to remedy that you're gonna steal my life story <laughs> yes. Different I was avenue. That in the pre-podcast too. Credit card debt. Uh. <laughs> so for fake internet points, Tom, what did you, or how did your week make it so you get up to that point, or how did your life get to the point that you made it to PAX? Oh man, um, I uh, I had no intention of going. Just gotten back from MLG Rally, and uh, a couple of the players and a couple of like the the people, like the managers and stuff for teams, like, oh, will you see you at PAX? I'm like, nah, no, nah, I'm not going to be going. They're basically saying, what do you mean you're not going? I was like, I'm, I'm not going, as in I, I have no plans to attend the event. And they didn't seem to comprehend English at that point, which is very, very strange because most of them spoke very, very good English. But anyway, uh, it's about Tuesday night and I start getting messages from players and managers like, check my Twitter. I found someone who needs a roommate. Quick, quick, quick. You could stay at this hotel. There's still a room. Blah, blah. I'm like, everybody's already on the ground in Seattle and I'm, you're trying to find me hotel rooms? And they're like, yeah, why? I was like, oh, God. So I shoveled out the $850 for round trip plane tickets and slept on the most comfortable set of chairs in Legion's room I've ever slept on. Uh, yeah. Well, Sounds if awful. you want the other end of that. No, spectrum, it was like, awesome. Oh, that sounds pretty awesome. Like two and a half months ago, it was like, oh, Monty, can you get me a press pass for, for PAX? Uh, because I wanted to cover it and I wanted to go there. And he's like, oh, yeah, I'm already going. And then I looked into it and like all the press passes were already, you know, essentially it was closed. And all the, I guess the passes were sold out too. I don't even know what was going on. So I was like, oh, I guess I'm not going. So those are the, that's a tale of two shoutcasters a wanted one and an unwanted one. Like I'm like looking <laughs> one who, forward wait, to wait, it. Like one who months tries and, months and one who doesn't try. Let's put it that way. Uh, it doesn't sound like you tried. It sounded like you didn't even <laughs> want to go. <laughs> oh but, no, I, mean, I wanted to go. I just didn't think I was gonna be able to like shovel it out. And the thing is, all the passes for packs, media passes, three day passes, singular day passes, they all sold out like two and a half months ago. Exactly. That, that's when I looked for it, and I was like, oh, I would like to go, and then I was like, oh, there's no passes. I guess I'm not going, even though like getting up there would not have been too big of a problem. Regardless, I'm happy you went up there. How was the weekend, despite the fact that you got whooped and got no skins? Oh my god, I'm never going to live this down. Uh, the weekend was awesome. I immediately went from the airport to the venue to watch the first day's matches. Um, being as I was staying with Legion, I was actually able to go into, like, the players' area and stuff like that, so that it was all set up and really, really cool. The players seemed to enjoy the way Riot threw things together. The stage itself was awesome. I don't know how much you guys got to see on the actual stream of the stage, but there was a big main screen in the middle, and then the players played on opposite sides of the stages with two more big screens to show the players and everything. And then the coolest feature ever at PAX was next to where the players were on screen were two giant screens that had mini maps on them so you could pay attention to the mini map even though you weren't actually playing which is really really <laughs> awesome it, it was like the coolest feature i ever seen like people are always like oh the mini map tells the entire story the mini map's so important right decided to put a giant fucking mini map screen on the stage and it was awesome so uh that was that was really really cool they had all these beanbag chairs set up too so everybody could just pile into like a a pit of filth and sit around and watch the sh watch the games which is where i spent most of my weekend because i'm a dirty dirty person but um other than that you like heard uh, it here first guys <laughs> i'm a dirty dirty little girl i mean person <laughs> uh once again pre-show banter a filthy, which I hope dirty is mouth <laughs> and hands and feet and other things that Sotair would find interesting but all um, them foot <laughs> fetishes <laughs> I, i'm actually <laughs> Go ahead. I don't want to interrupt your uh, your story as to the week. I kind of my my train of thought just went off the rail and like into the school that was next to the, the railroad tracks at this point. So go on. 
Are you saying you're a pedophile, Tob? Sure, go on. Nelly. <laughs> <laughs> New news. Um, actually, I, I actually had a really great question for you. Oh my god, it's completely off topic. Oh, wow. Okay, so this is something completely, I think, T-Force podcast taboo, almost along the lines of foot fetishes, but I was wondering, <laughs> you follow Dota 2 a little bit. Oh, yeah, Do totally. you not, Tom? What, oh, I what happened? Could you tell us in like 30 seconds, because I don't follow it at all, what happened this weekend for them? There was an event that I wasn't able to go to. Right, but I heard they had like ridiculous <laughs> amounts of viewers for it. Like, oh, oh, okay. one it was so, like a w- one million or one and a half million was, prize pool. It was but a I also one heard... and a half million okay. prize pool. They mm-hmm. invited teams from around the world. So we had China, we had teams from Europe, we had North American teams, we had teams from countries I don't even know existed that somehow had copies of Dota Two. They were all <laughs> together at the giant invitational where Toby Wan and then some guy from MTW or something like that were shoutcasting. And the event and everything was really awesome. When you compared the in audience attendance to League of Legends, it looked like some. It, it literally was like big. It was like big spike of League of Legends viewers. There's probably like two thousand or more people crammed into this hall at the League of Legends place, but only a couple hundred at the Dota place. But because you had teams from like mainland China competing, they had I think Valve reported like. 500,000 viewers or something. And one of the things that was really cool is that the Valve has integrated, you were able to watch it through the Dota 2 client or something like that. I don't know. I haven't actually tested it out, but uh, apparently it worked out very, very well for them. Yeah, I mean, I heard ridiculous numbers as to viewing. And I mean, I'm not like jumping on the Dota 2 bandwagon. I mean, Optimus Tom is the only trader in the T-Force podcast that I know of who will actually be interested in this game. But I do worry when I see like really big numbers from different games. I'm like, what actually happened over there? And I can't get straight numbers either because they're like, oh, 1.5 million concurrent viewers. I'm like, that's not right. That is not right at all. Did you hear what happened at the uh, whatever it was, the qualifiers for... uh, one of the Southeast Asia regional qualifiers that happened over the weekend, there was like 51,000 in-person attendees or something for a League of Legends tournament. I did not hear. Tell us more about that, Mr. Tom. I, I actually just heard about this maybe an hour or two beforehand, but uh, this is going to be a spoiler alert. Better off than when I did the Lot of Mortis Sheen procs. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the, the regional invitational event where um, it was there was one in Taipei, I think it is, where the Taipei Assassins took the first seed. Surprise, surprise there. Um they wound up, you know, they did it for season two finals, and I believe it was in like this giant mall, and there was a picture of like oh, I a did screen see of that. and the venue, and there were just people on every single floor, look like crowding around this screen that looked like it was a French McDonald's because it was all mobbed together and everything. I've never been to France, but I've heard that example and I use it all the time. Apparently, French McDonald's are mob scenes. Regardless mm. of that, they reported that there were like fifty-one thousand in-person attendees. And it's been the largest actual live audience for an esports event ever. I mean, that's about half as much as you can fit into, you know, Michigan State Stadium <laughs> or thereabouts, um, which is impressive. I mean, I'm actually Michigan not trying Stadium. to say that to belittle it. I'm just saying, like, that's one of the bigger stadiums. Michigan or Michigan Don't State? Don't you mean the big house? It, which, which, I don't know. I don't yeah, really Michigan, follow college football. The, I hate college football. The, but the Michigan Stadium. The, the it is in Michigan is the big house with, like, 100,000 or something around those. Yes. All right. Yes, it's, it's the big one. The That's big why one. it's called the Big House. Hey. I, I never would have gotten that. <laughs> wow, really? Wow. <laughs> okay, well, back to regionals. I mean, Tom, do you have any more experiences, like on-site experiences you want to share with us, or should we get into the gameplay and all that fun and excitement? <laughs> um, it was it was pretty cool. There was a giant line that was constantly out the door, so the people didn't have to get skin codes. You could type your summoner name in if you waited in this three-hour line. And you were able to get both the skins for free if you just typed it in. So there's a huge line with that. There was a line where people were able to play like ARAM, um, as long as it wasn't on the main stage, uh, Dominion, or like regular 5v5s with like rioters and stuff like that. So that was pretty cool. Um, oh, wait. So all you had to do was type your summoner name in? So I actually probably have a PAX and, uh, or PAX Sona and Riot skin in my, on my game now, thanks to you, don't I? 
<laughs> yeah, I waited in the, like the four hour line to try to get a Paxson and a Riot Graze while I wasn't able to see the screen because there are too many you, people standing in my way to watch. You have a press pass. Don't you know how a press pass works at PAX? I've been there for two <laughs> years. You just walk up and go, hey, I'm press. All right, come over here. Let's do an interview and do this. Hey, can I put my name in that computer? Yeah, sure. Here, I'm going to oh. get you in the front of the line. Oh, hold on a second. Names in that computer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hold on a second. Um, I do have to say that the press pass was effectively nothing at PAX Prime. Um, yeah. it did, it did allow me to get, you know, like if I was like kind of standing backstage, I wasn't thrown out of the venue or something like that. So I was able to like go back and talk to some rioters. It did help us get interviews and everything, but the people gave out exhibitor passes like they were candy. So people just pretty much stopped paying attention to anything <coughs> that just didn't say three, like day three pass or anything. So, uh, nobody really got anywhere that they weren't supposed to be or anything, but, uh, there's basically no difference between having, like, a news pass and anything else, because all the players, all the Riot staff, like, the entire Riot area, like, 20% of the people there had exhibitor passes, so... The rest well, of the Tom, didn't I'm going to say that you were doing it wrong okay. because I can specifically remember going there with a press pass, and this wasn't like this wasn't like when it was first there. And going, hey, I have a press pass, and then going, hey, I have, can I have this interview at two o'clock? And they're like, yeah, let's go for it. And they didn't even check. They oh, didn't check well, shit. we were we were able to get interviews with the rioters. We were able to get interviews with pros. Pros, it was just a matter of walking up to them, being like, hey, can I get an interview? And like, yeah, sure. The rioters was a little bit of a different story. We had to check with uh, the PR manager, and then he's like, oh, yeah, you can come back at, like, 5 o'clock. We'll have an interview, blah, blah, blah. That's how we got the interview with Morello, an interview that will be dropping a little bit later on in this week that I think everybody will be able to find very interesting. But all the player interviews, all we had to do was just go to the players. and Like, yeah, let's do it. And then we walked off into a corner. Well, let's talk about some of the games that happened this last weekend. I know in our Bold Predictions article, I don't think anybody's Bold Prediction came nearly as true as mine, and mine was completely out of left field. Uh, I had predicted that Dignitas was going to make it all the way to the finals and win the finals by only losing one game, and they made it all the way there and then got stomped by not lo- and without losing a game. <laughs> I, I yeah. mean, I picked the top three. I mean, what can I say? Did you? I, I, I don't remember. Basically, um, I just went to all the predictions. Yeah, no, no one cares about what I wrote, but I mean, basically what happened was all chalk. Like, people left as they came in with the same seedings, except, you know, Dignitas swapped with CLG, but Dignitas, you know, probably could have had that number two seed if they tried harder the week before at MLG Volley. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so it was basically, you know, status quo across the board. I mean, there were some surprising matches. I think, you know, Curse taking it off a game of TSM was kind of surprising. Legion taking a game off CLG really made that first series very exciting uh, for anyone watching it. Uh, but beyond that, there weren't like too many crazy things that happened. I think one of the, I wouldn't say crazier things, we've seen like a lot of Gragas play lately, um, a lot of other teams, and I've had a couple questions about him come in to our email and our Twitter asking, do you guys think that Gragas is going to see a nerf anytime soon? Because a lot of times he can sit in the middle, he can farm the waves, he can sustain using his W, if I remember correctly, where he gains his health back. And, mana um, and health. Mana health is just from his passive and the W there is for go. his mana. But, you know, being able to stay, sustain, self-sustain yourself in lane while being able to farm an entire creep wave once it comes up with a barrel after a couple levels, you know, to some people it seems quite overpowered. And what I've been responding to people with is I don't think he's going to see a nerf bat anytime soon. Uh-oh. Maybe a quick adjustment, but I just think it's, you know, people are understanding how to play the game. You do know he's, he's just already nerfed. nerfed. Yeah, he just got nerfed. <laughs> right, no, he, he got a buff too, like two no. patches ago, dude. Yeah, well, two no, patches well, he ago... Got a- he- yeah, two patches Dog. ago he got a base health and a movement speed bonus to his body slam, and now they nerfed his body slam, okay. and they also nerfed... Uh, his ult. What did they nerf? They nerfed, uh, they nerfed ult, the cooldown is... to his ult, and they also increased the mana cost of body slam. So he it's... did get a nerf, and it was before NA regionals, but they weren't playing on that patch. So you'll mm-hmm. see less of him, and I think he's actually going to disappear again, but it's like every time like the finals come up or the regionals come up, like this happened actually I think in the Season 1 finals too, where Shushe was playing a lot of Gragas, I think Reginald played some Gragas too, is people are like, oh, he's really good again. Um, and like if he gets nerfed the smallest bit, which he did get nerfed, and I think everyone will stop playing him again, because actually he got two pretty big nerfs. One, Abyssal Scepter got nerfed, and then he also got the nerfs that we just mentioned. Um so I don't think he'll be played, and he's ugly, and so people just tend not to like playing him. <laughs> no, oh, Jesus. But, I think the but, biggest the biggest hit to Gragas was the ultimate nerf, I think, because yeah. you used to be able to roam around with body slam. Even if they like change body slam a little bit, you could still roam with it, which is which is fine. But the thing is, his ultimate at level three 
used to have a 60 second cooldown with blue buff that's like 45 35. seconds 35 seconds it's insane how quick his ultimate would come up so he always had it for team fights he always had it in engagements I don't know how many times we saw this weekend where they get in a team fight, he'd initiate with his barrel and catch someone out, and then like while they were still chasing down the AD carry, he was able to like use it again and catch them out. It was insane. So that's the biggest nerf, I think. The thing is with his damage and everything, which is what some of the listeners were talking about, he needs to have something to keep him good in lane because he is a melee caster as opposed to the nine hundred million range casters that are in uh, the AP mid role in League of Legends. So he has to have some sort of balancing out like that. He also has to get close and in your face in order to do anything because he has Body Slam as one of his spells. So it kind of trades off of them. Uh, I think we are going to see less of Gragas, but I think he's going to be put into more specific team compositions rather than just like, oh, who's really good at mid? Oh, let me pick Gragas. Yeah, I mean, right now he's good at everything, but we saw he's actually one of the best poke lanes because his barrel has good range. It also has a good auto attack speed debuff uh, to go along with his Q. Um, it used to be on his ultimate. They changed that, made him, you know, significantly more viable as a ranged caster. And he is a great champion. One thing that we saw this weekend was Big Fat LP, um, you know, pretty consistently would be playing Ragus and not getting the blue buff. They decided to give the blue buff to Voiboy, who in that series was playing Olaf and actually throughout the entire tournament played Olaf and was really amazing at it. Um, so that was kind of an interesting thing. They were using Drunken Rage on Gragas, and he was able to farm up and, you know, stay ahead of him farm, you know, basically the entire time without the use of blue buff, which basically no other AP middles can do. I mean, uh, thinking about it, Morgana can do okay without blue buff. Obviously, there's you know the people who don't use mana who can do well, Vladimir, Kennen, so on and so forth. But out of the you know AP middles that use mana, Gragas is probably the most self-sustaining one. Um, so he still has that going for him, but he can't roam quite as well because uh, Body Slam mana cost did get increased. The cooldown on his ultimate did get increased as well. So if he you know roams to another lane, he's suddenly going to you know, take more mana because his big advantage is getting there faster with Body Slam, and then another big advantage is, oh, even if you threw your ultimate down, by the time you got back into lane, it was going to be back up, and that no longer is really the case. Yeah, I've always been... I've been on the fence about whether or not we should continue to play Gragas. In, in a lot, you know, in a lot of these games, we've seen the we've seen the difference of him coming in the solo queue. Um, you don't really see him played at all all that often, especially down in the you know fifteen hundreds. A lot of people kind of stick to the same characters. I'm going to roll this into another question here in a moment, but uh, I was actually very excited for a brief moment when Legion was playing CLG. They were going into their second game after lo- losing the first one, and Lotta Mortis had Gragas picked, but obviously it was for the middle, oh. and I thought he was going to jungle Gragas, like pull out some hidden tech here that we you know, hadn't <laughs> seen, because I had seen Hornet play him hit a bit. I was really excited. I was like, jungle Gragas, yes, this is going to be something new and exciting, and you know, he's going to get the six in the barrel, and and they swapped it, and I was like, oh, nothing, you know, nothing besides CLG running promote this weekend that was out of the ordinary. Eh, I mean... We, we did see a lot of standard stuff, but everybody was pretty much, you know, everybody was pretty scared. They wanted to win. They wanted to advance. It was single elimination, which is something that is very, very, uh, very important that everybody keeps in mind that being single elimination, it's like you fuck up once and that's about it. So right. you, you had to play safe. You had to be secure in your strategy. If you're going to bust out something weird, you have been practicing that weird for forever. Um, like when Dignitas decided they're going to bust out a poke comp, which everybody thought was weird, but it's really they did CLG's own strategy against them. They used like before they went to Korea, and CLG apparently forgot that it existed. But um, like everybody who had all these things practiced them and practiced them a ridiculous amount. We even saw CLG using the promotes. I think they did it against Invictus Gaming. There was a prize fight or whatever um, at the OGN. Like after they got eliminated from OGN. They had like a prize fight with IG and they wound up using the strategy and it didn't work against IG because IG is the masters of playing crazy stuff like AP mid Yi and things like that, which uh, ironically talking to some of the players, IG is one of the teams they're really afraid of when it comes to single only sh- elimination format. But everybody really wants to play like standard stuff that they're comfortable with playing so they don't just immediately go down zero one and then are on the fringe of being knocked out. I mean, you can say that a lot of standard stuff was played, but we did see, you know, we saw the poke comps, we saw the promotes, 
We saw Cho'Gath in the jungle. We saw Shivana resurgence in the jungle. We saw a lot of things that we haven't really seen in a while. And while they, you know, might be kind of like standard par for the course, you know, if you look back over the course of the last year, you know, in the past couple of months, we haven't been seeing that that much. Um, so I, I was I was pretty excited with the diversity that we saw in the matchups. We saw some Zyra in there from Legion as well. Um, a lot of like really entertaining stuff. Olaf going 1v2 and doing so well. One thing... Um, and I guess I'm going to get it out there because I don't know how much longer we're going to talk about MLG or rather Pax Prime. Yeah, go for it. Um, was, I was surprised, like, everyone, you know, they were trying their hardest, obviously, but there was also a lot of mistakes throughout the games. Um, you know, a lot of missed ultimates on Shivana that I'm sure people have, you know, noted. Uh, and there were also some, like, really basic mistakes made. Um, you know, one thing that comes to mind was Hotshot GG in one of his games. Like, every game on Cho'Gath, which is kind of an unusual jungler pick because he doesn't tend to have really great ganks, but he would rush those boots of mobility. They seem to really do a good job on him and rush a, an Oracle normally. Um, so that seemed to work for them, you know, against Legion, not so much against CLG where he kind of died a couple times against that Gragas mid, um, or rather against Dignitas. Um, but he also, in one game, rushed a Sunfire Cape then decide to sell that, then build towards a Randuin, then builds towards a Frodo doesn't heart, and this was like after 50 minutes, and I was just like, you know, you popularized the Frozen Heart Cho'Gath build. Why would you not be building this when your you know build obviously lacks a lot of CDR? You're not getting that much of it. You're not. You're obviously not going to take blue buff from your AP carrier or so on and so forth. Whether they're giving it to AP or top at that t point in time. Um, so I saw a lot of kind of basic mistakes that were made, and it really made me think. Oh my goodness, this. I mean, it it was really big time. This was the difference between you know, CLG and Curse, for instance. You know, really being you know, part of the Riot's plans for the next year and being part of the community and, you know, getting paid to play. And I don't think Curse actually has any, you know, particular problems, like, with their income. I think they'll all be okay. But obviously there was a lot on the line and all the players felt that there was a lot of, a lot on the line. And because of that, there were some uncharacteristic mistakes that we saw made. Yeah. Do you think some of those uncharacteristic mistakes came from the way the stage was set up and the way people were... Uh, I heard some complaints about you could you could pretty much ghost the the other team because you could hear them yelling and you know you're in front of this big audience and the production is so high. Do you think any of those mistakes came from the you know the atmosphere and all that? I can I can kind of I can kind of answer this one a little bit uh, since I was there. Um, the way they set it up, like the casters and everything are on their own little island in the middle of the crowd, which is awesome. I wish I had a caster island. I employed Monty to go out and buy me a caster island, but we'll have to see if that works. But um. The, the sound was really, really good, and, like, the place was loud. It was really freaking loud. So the casters are going over the same system all the music and everything was. So I was actually really interested to see uh, how the players would react because they had the noise-canceling headphones, and they had white noise headphones in and everything, similar to what they would have, like, an MLG, just minus the booth. They had extra headphones instead. Um, they were literally across the stage from one another, so I didn't think they'd be able to hear each other, especially over all the noise that was in the actual room. So I don't know how much credit I would give to that. But the fact is, when they were going over the keys to victory, this is one thing that I, that really, really oh, hurts yeah. me. When they went over the keys to victory for each team to like be like what they had to do in order to win, the players were on stage watching the screen with their headphones off. I was, I was watching that, and I had mentioned the same thing. I said, wow, you're really going to go over the keys to victory with the other team sitting right there? Obviously, it's not going to affect them too, too much. But at the same time, you're like, you have to... I remember the one you have to effectively shut down St. Vicious in the jungle. He's an aggressive jungle, and if you shut him down, they're going to shut Curse down. And I'm like, why? Why Why would you say this out loud so the other team can hear it? Maybe they're going to adjust their strategy really quickly because they're going to go, wow, that's a really good idea. <laughs> oh, I suddenly realized that we have to shut him down. No, I don't think that was a big point. I mean, you can kind of make an analogy towards an NFL pregame in the sense that, oh, they give all these strategies and whatnot, and the players could listen to it, but, of course, they're prepared. I mean, on all these teams were very well prepared, or should have been very well prepared for this matchup, or for this tournament. I don't really think they're suddenly like, oh, man, Jat just made a good point. I should listen to the Jat and do this. And, I and like, obviously a lot of those things were great, and I liked it. I like what it brought to the fans. Uh, but at the same time, you know, St. Vicious is not actually one of the more aggressive junglers and they in one of the games that were comparing you know saint vicious to unstoppable 
And Unstoppable is actually, you know, a pretty aggressive jungler, where St. Vicious is more of a farm-based jungler, and they kept on, you know, saying that it was the opposite. And I was like, oh, this is kind of unusual. And then they were so surprised, they were like, oh, Unstoppable has been going for a lot of ganks, so on and so forth. Uh, but St. Vicious, you know, does what he tends to do, and that is get ahead of most junglers in farm, and that is what he's really well known for, I think, as opposed to being aggressive. Anyways, uh point is i don't think any of the teams would be like oh my goodness that's crazy we should change our strategy you know in the next 30 seconds but what i did hear i think it was chowster or, or chaos uh mentioned that they could actually hear the announcers while they were shout casting so mm -hmm. they could essentially ghost through that during the game yeah there was a uh, like i said the place is really really loud the shout casters could be heard by absolutely everybody i didn't think that the headphones and everything were enough I think Riot really needed to like either invest in boots or like have the players elsewhere. It was really cool to have him front and center on stage. So you could see what was going on during the entire thing. But there are two giant screens. You could see the people anyway, especially if you're in the back. So it didn't really matter. Um, I think overall the stage setup needed a like needed a little bit of work for the players per perspective because I think they could just hear the shoutcasters and even. Even though like there's no delay because it's on the tournament client and Riot's been doing no delay whatsoever on the tournament client, which is something we did at MLG. There was like a, a 0.5 to one second delay and that was it. And it was really really cool. But because of this, as you said, a lot of the players if they can hear the casters, they can kind of like note what's going on. And like thinking back to it, there was a play between C between CLG and Legion. It was in game number two, I want to say. Lot of Mortis comes all the way down through the brushes for a gank on bottom lane, and Chogoth is standing on a ward, uh, of an allied ward in the tri brush in bottom lane, and Double Lift and Chowster are sitting there, kind of near their tower, but not going any further. And Legion, I talked to them after the game, like there's no way they had a ward there. We timed it, we had everything down pat. There was no ward in that bush, and they were just sitting there for maybe a minute or two. After a minute or two. CLG keeps like starts pinging the bush like they're still there they're still there and there was no way that they could have known they were there yeah I mean it's tough to say no way besides the shoutcasters and I mean it's it's hard you could look at the VODs and you can kind of you know guess as to what was happening there um, and it's just hard to say because obviously CLG has a lot of experience maybe they're like oh well, obviously the jungler hasn't turned up anywhere else. He's Vlad Mortis tends to sit in bushes for a really long time. Uh, maybe they're pinging out of caution, or maybe they heard something over the overcom system. Um, other, I mean, anyways, it's unfortunate. Obviously, something more is going to be, have to be done um, for the championships, for the season two championships. But from a viewer's perspective, everything seemed pretty fun. Oh yeah, no, it was it was a blast. Like. Uh... In between games and everything, this is the coolest part. I don't know if any of this got streamed, but they had like a bunch of rioters come out on stage. They're hyping people up and like throwing oranges into the crowd with Gangplank's face on it. It says like, it's K and stuff like that. They had t-shirts nope. that they were giving away. They had giant Kog'Maws that had like air compression guns behind them. So you would put a t-shirt in Kog'Maw's mouth and he'd shoot it out into the crowd. It was really awesome. <laughs> hmm. Did you get us t-shirts and oranges too, Tom? Hell no! <laughs> Along with those skins that I actually I just checked my account and I I don't seem to have a Riot Graves or a oh, Paxona. Oh. What's going oh, on? It's, man. it's really so weird, tear. Tom. I don't have mine either. So What's tear. going on here? I'm I think we so sorry. I'm so uh. sorry. I confused your account with so terror spelled with a zero that has high yellow. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Do you remember that tweet that I put out last week? I put like three of them out. If Optimus Tom comes back from Pax without a Paxona for the podcast, he's fired. I had I a Paxona. I had a one. single Paxona. You're fired. Okay. Fired. Bye. Donald Troop <laughs> just fired you. I was gonna buy. I was gonna buy the Riot Graves, and and Pone was like, "Yeah, no, Tom's got it. you. Don't buy it. Tom's gone forever." <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> now it's now it's there until season two finals. It's, hang, it's hanging out with uh, what Silent Night Sona or whatever. Yeah. Oh, I <laughs> wish I had bought. Silent Night Sona. I do too. The, I want that one so much. That one that got away. So. Uh, enough about um, esports right now because we're on the second half of the show, and I kind of want to walk into some questions that Drosslender forgot to forward to the group. And now that we have, <laughs> I didn't forget to forward them. There was a malfunction with our email forwarder, so we're like, "Oh, that's yeah, weird. That's we're not true. getting emails anymore." <laughs> uh, yeah, people don't love and us. And then we oh. actually logged into the account, and there was just like tons of them. So I blame uh, our web host. 
Uh, okay, blame the web host, blame Google Groups, whatever. So a guy named by the name of Jeff, he's just about 1,700 ELO. He wrote us a few weeks ago and said um, he plays support for his team, and he main support now because of it. And he said it really frustrates him when I hear people looking down and underrating supports. He, they can't see how much utility support can bring to a team fight or how much control they can perform in lane. It pains me to see when some people are forced into support but do a terrible job because how little they value the role. Last week, I believe we kind of touched on this. We did. I'm gonna, I actually gave I'm it a re- good touching on because I was excited about that question, but I think I think we <laughs> should give it some more touching on. Touching on. Well, I'm going to give it... I just, I'm, I'm kind of going through our list, yeah. You know, we gave this one a really good touch on last week where, <laughs> uh, again, episode number 43, you can go and, list, uh, go and listen how we talked about, you know, how to play as support. We had really uh, championed bringing supports in the solo queue and being able to carry with it. We know Sotir, if you ever watched him stream, when he did stream, played a lot of Janna in the bottom lane and helped carry his team that way actually I, I believe you got odd one wants to say good job jana <laughs> i i did it was odd one and someone else on his team i i saved that game save it so hard <laughs> my claim to fame is odd one said i was good yeah i must yeah. be good i <laughs> must be good <laughs> so oh, we, we got another listener from western australia this is going to lead into this question his name is lee he, um listening from the other side of the world from us he says how do I how do I strap the team on my back in solo queue and carry us? You know, what role am I going to play the best? How can I do this? What do I need to work on to, you know, effectively carry myself back up to at least 1,200 ELO? So, Ter, go. Um, actually, you know, how I can't remember his name. There was a guy who's done this a number of times. He's, like, gone to zero ELO and climbed back up camera. Camera. And he's actually made posts on the general discussion forums, um, indicating how the best way to do it. I actually also have an article at ggchronicle.com over the bar, little promotion for our, our website here, uh, where I've you know kind of listed ways to get better without actually getting better, way to raise to raise your elo. But camera does a good thing in the sense that he's you know tested all sorts of characters, all sorts of roles, and explained, oh you, okay, this is what you want to do. And generally, it, like to sum it up all in a nutshell, he's always said, pick a mid game carry. And that might be, you know, counterintuitive to any, everyone who, who's listening. You know, why don't I pick a late game carry or an early game carry? Um, but a mid game carry seems to be the best. And what he means by mid game carry is TF, Pantheon, um, LeBlanc, to some extent. You know, champions that really can demoralize the enemy team right around that mid game period, right when it hits 20 minutes, and get them to, you know, surrender essentially, or give up, or, you know, cause some dissension among the en- amongst the enemy team. Globals obviously are good. You don't tend to see very many bands of Pantheon or TF in low ELO, I don't believe. Um, you know, he, TF is a pretty high priority ban as you keep on moving up, because some people have used his, you know, his skills to get to high ELO, but he can really provide you a lot, in addition to, you know, staying even with your lane, or perhaps winning your lane, you can jump to other lanes and really change them around for yourself as well. So if you want someone, if you feel like you're really good and you want to, you know, change the game, you want to impact the game, then you pick, you know, Pantheon or Twisted Fate, who can jump around the map and bring your goodness to every single lane, uh, you know, <laughs> all the time, and just keep on jumping around and make, essentially, demoralize the enemy team. And I think that's the kind of the strategy to go with. Shaco's always actually been really good at this, too. You know, he'll go in and out of favor. Uh, you don't want to pick someone to troll your team, so if your team doesn't want Pantheon, that's kind of an issue. Um, but because uh, you obviously don't want to demoralize your own team, but at the same time, he is a great mid-game carry. Um, there's no doubt about that. I think another one of the questions coming here is, hey, I'm last pick, or I'm second to last pick every time I queue, and I'm stuck with a support with a role I don't understand or a role I don't want to play. Besides the obvious of learning how to play those roles, you know, how do you carry from a support slot? Do you... You know, in my opinion, I think you just, you just need to learn to learn every spot, especially if you're down there and you're being put in the last spot every time, because you're not going to get the character you want. Um, and on your climb up there, do you do you call mid in the bottom and take it anyway, or do you play those roles and try to carry from those perspective lanes? You buy an Oracle's <laughs> elixir and run around the map. Not even That's kidding. Yes and no. <laughs> not not even like not even kidding. If like okay, personal experience time. Uh, I haven't been doing too well in my own solo queue game, so I've fallen to the spot of, okay, you're, like, last pick or second to last pick, and, like, the one person is like, hey, let's, uh, let me AD carry. I'm like, okay, 
last time I did this, I lost. Let me just pick up the support character. And then your AD carry winds up like being really, really bad. One of the best things you can do if you're, if you know you're a support character and your AD carry like will keep dying or just does not decide to farm or whatever is try to get your GP 10s, get an Oracle's elixir and wards and like literally go around and try to help as many different places on the map as possible. If your tower falls and your AD carry is left by himself with no tower whatsoever, that that carry and support are probably going to go somewhere else so they can farm up a little bit and if you have the vision and everything warded and your team is a little bit competent at all by having all those wards and denial of vision it'll essentially be i'm going to do this as an example what happened with um i think it was it was tsm and curse i think it was where dyrus was jace and they knocked down his top tower very very quickly and he wanted to go roam around and then he wound up losing out in CS to... No, it was against uh, Monomaniac. He wound up losing out in CS to Kale, even though they 3v1'd Kale, essentially, and knocked down the tower. He lost out in CS to Kale. He wound up dropping in levels. He did nowhere to go whatsoever because Monomaniac mm-hmm. kept the map just lit up, and every single time he went to go somewhere else, they just pulled back. So, essentially, the lane won really, really early, and then Dyrus had nowhere to go whatsoever. Right. Yeah, and... We actually talked about that on Meta Musings. That was kind of a mistake on their part. Like they were like, "Oh, what do we do with Jace?" And they decided to do nothing with him. Um, but it turned out okay with them, for whatever reason. Anyway, um, I don't. I mean, there is that argument. I think this kind of goes back to Jeff's, you know, comment email to us, which was the first one we addressed, and we actually addressed last week, where you know a lot of people don't appreciate supports. Okay, even if your AD carry sucks, I mean, I'm going to go with a counter position to Tom. Tom's strategy, I actually like it, um, but the counter position is, even if your AD carry sucks, all AD carries are going to miss some CS. Even professionals miss some CS. Don't harp on that. Just let him, you know, do his thing. Try to get them as many CS as humanly possible um, and stick with them because you need them to be farmed if you're planning on winning. Now, of course, you know, roaming around, getting an Oracle's, can be a good idea, but if you lose that oracle, suddenly you're just going to lose the game um, because that's 400 gold and you don't make that much gold as a support. Um, so you have to be very, very careful with that strategy. W- one thing I would say, and and a really great nugget coming from Tom's uh, experience, is if you let the bottom lane tower get taken, if your AD carry isn't really well, if your AD carry knows what's going on, knows that they're losing, and is very careful, he can freeze the lane and actually start farming even though you completely lost the lane. So a lot of times in a losing lane, it seems kind of counterintuitive because you're losing a lot of dragon control. But if you're losing the lane, you don't have dragon control anyway. So you may as well lose it, lose the tower, freeze the lane for as, you know, as long as possible and try to catch up and farm. And that does sometimes work. Uh, so that's a good idea. But I think really the answer to the question is you're going to be you know, bottom two picks I think 40% of the time, by my math. Um, so you're going to have to get used to playing some positions you don't like. And my suggestion has always been find one champion that you can play in those roles that you're not going to do terrible at. So if you really hate jungle, you know, find one champion that you're okay with. You know, Udyr, Warwick, anyone. Just find someone that you're like mediocre with. If you're playing support, find someone you're okay with. Tarek's really easy to learn. Soraka's really easy to learn. And don't complain. Like, just, you know, Play your role and do what you can do because if you are bottom pick, you you essentially have two strategies. You can you know kind of troll you know the top picks and just do whatever you're going to do, and that's probably going to lead to a dodge nowadays, which is fine, I guess. Um, but if it doesn't lead to a dodge, then suddenly you've upset everyone on your team. It's probably going to lead to a loss, uh, which is a bad thing, which is what everyone doesn't want. So my suggestion would be learn every role to a minimal degree so you can be put into it. And I, I, I want to add to that. Learn someone that's relatively safe or standard. Don't be like, oh, I'm going to play support. Let me play Blitzcrank and try to hit all these hooks even though I've never done it before. Let me play mm-hmm. Leona and jump into the middle of a battle and wind up dying because I've never done it before. Don't play someone that's like high risk, high reward. Play someone that's relatively safe. If you're in the jungle, play someone that can farm up and maybe carry at some point later in the game. Like, um, I know he's a little bit expensive, but I like one of the characters that I always suggest to my friends to first learn a jungle is usually Nocturne. Because you can either sit in the jungle and farm and help yourself out by getting mm-hmm. damaging items for later on in the game. Or you can utility your team, go for the Randuin's Omen and more of a build like the odd one is familiar with. 
Or you could also be that, well, I'm Nocturne, I'm going to run into lane and gank all the time. So he kind of fits multiple roles and can go into different kinds of team comps. Same thing with, like, the bottom lane. If you're going to pick a support character, don't pick Leona, who's going to jump into everything. You might not know how to build her specifically. Pick Soraka and build for the Shrelia's Reverie so your team can engage and disengage effectively. Or pick Sona, because even though Sona has a heal, you could still sit in a bush and poke, and you can learn the importance of brush control on a support character. And just pick someone that... Don't pick someone that's like high risk, high reward just because you see the pros doing it. Pick someone that you literally could sit back and learn the role with. I don't think we talk enough about ranked fives or predetermined fives or prearranged fives on this podcast. We spend a lot of time on solo queue. And I think if you have access to people to play with, that you should play a lot more um, fived, fives games, even if it's blind pick, because that'll teach you a lot more about the game than playing solo queue does. If you listen to Sheen Prox, which I put uh, together last week, we had Scumbag Crepo, who is the support for CLG EU. I asked him, what do you think about solo queue? And he basically said, I think it's, you know, he won't say he thought it was a waste of time, but he basically said it's not going to really teach you that much more than you know, you're going to learn a lot more if you play in the ranked 5v5s or you play in a 5s team. And um, I feel like when I played this game, Auslander, when Ranhurt was on the podcast, uh, Hornet, and then we'd find a random fifth, we played 5s just about every single night that we could. And I think that taught me more about the game than any solo queue ever would because I was forced into the same role all the time. So I was forced to learn that one role. And then, you know, we would shake it up. I would jump into another role and really learn it. I could watch the other lanes and see how they played because they more than less knew how to play you know, there are certain lanes and it really teaches you more about the game than jumping from one lane to the next to the jungle all the time like you do in solo queue so you know in my opinion if you have people to play with if you can grab at least three people and you can you know hopefully you can grab five i think you should jump into the 5v5s Ooh, little little nugget of joy picked up from pax uh uh, for those of you that may have paid attention to Twitter over the weekend, there was a little bit of a troll conspiracy going on between Team Dynamic and Monomaniac mm -hmm. and Legion, where uh, oh, yeah. it all started because Law Mortis left his Twitter logged in one of the computers downstairs, and Xmitty thought the best thing possible to troll people with would be say that he quit Legion. And There's a whole troll thing that went around, and there are like, all these pretend team swaps, and it fooled a lot of people, uh, GG Chronicle included. Which uh, was was kind of no, dumb. Not GG Chronicle. <laughs> okay, it did, one person, one on, person GG on GG Chronicle got fooled by it. But um, what basically came out of it was besides a lot of confusing and a, a confusion, and a lot of laughs and a lot of drinks was um, uh, after like the aftermath of everything, all three of the teams kind of sat down and were like, "Hey, that'd be a good idea. Why don't we switch players and switch roles and like try to learn what everybody's thinking and blah 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 blah." So, like, therefore, we could learn what, like, the jungler playing a support character now knows what the support has to think of, whereas, like, the support character playing the top role now knows what's going on on that half of the map. And teams like uh, Monomaniac in the first place are really good at doing this because all their players are really competent at playing any position in any role. It's just that they feel like the roles that they're in are the strongest ones. So, uh, as Pone was saying, if you have a group of five people, even if it's not ranked fives, even if you're playing normal fives or you're playing what, like, 10 of your friends, which is something that I, I used to do a lot, was get 10 of your friends on and then just play in-houses and always constantly swap roles so you know what's going on. You can practice characters. It's one of the best things you could actually do. I would like to, once again, point out the counterpoint. And, you know, I oh, noticed fuck that... fuck you, like, Soter! Well, not, no, uh, no. not actually to you, to Phonophobia. <laughs> Phonophobia, uh, okay, like, you're good, that you're was good. his tagline for the Sheen, the Sheen uh, proc interview. But then when I listened to it, Krepo said... You know, what essentially all pro players say, oh, it's not that important. But Krepo actually gave it a lot more credit than a lot of other people. And he said, you know, it's really good for learning the matchups. Um, and that's important. Like, the the problem with fives is if you can get fives, yeah, they are great. But if they do pigeonhole you into one role, maybe that's not as good. Because you need to know everything about the game to be competent in any role. Because you need to know what's happening all around the map. Uh, it really helps you, you know, be more aware of why, you know, why things are happening and why is your top lane losing well because the jungler has gone up there more why is their jungler able to go up there more because you know they've had more team pressure in the jungle against your own jungle have been doing some counter jungling really slow down your jungler even if it was just at level one anyways there's so many things that go into it um i think you know obviously the key to getting better at any at anything in life is doing it more um, and that's, you know, certainly there's no exception here to League of Legends. It's not like there's a free, easy pass. Oh, here, you're suddenly good at this game. Now you just have to keep on doing it. 
Um, and while 5v5 might be the optimal way to do it, um, there's actually, you know, well, actually, I, I can say that it might be more optimal than solo queue. Probably the most optimal way to do it is if you really want to learn a role is to do 1v1 in a lane against someone. Say you're a top laner, you know, go 1v1 against someone who's at equal level to you. And then you can suddenly learn, oh, this is where I messed up. And you don't have the outside influences. But solo queue is great because you have to deal with a lot of outside influences. You have to deal with your own team, and with the other team, doing things that you don't expect. And that is all certainly part of the game and something you really have to get used to. But I think the counterpoint to you here is by forcing somebody into one role for, let's say, one month. You sit down with your five friends, and three nights a week, you all play 5v5s and blind pick, and you're forced into the top role. You're going to learn You're going to learn just about every matchup. And I mean, speak, talking from personal experience, this is what happened to me in our ranked fives. I had never played top before, besides, you know, a few, really a few times here in solo queue and whatnot. And by doing that, I started learning the matchups. Now, if you go into solo queue, or you go into blind pick and try to grab it all the time, you're not going to always get that role that you want, because maybe you're stuck at the fourth or you know fifth pick in solo queue so by playing those fives for a month three weeks whatever and always having this particular role you're going to see just about every matchup that you could think of and it's going to get you better at that lane and then you swap it around and you start playing mid and that's why i think playing this game with friends is the best way to learn i realize that's not going to be the best for everybody that is playing but or you know that not everybody has that luxury of doing that but in my opinion that's that's one of the best ways to learn this game besides jumping in a solo queue and just going for it I mean, I'm not arguing that it's a good way. I'm just saying it's not as feasible. And you can say, oh, I'm going to learn every matchup over the course of a month. Well, how many you know, 5v5 matchups are you going to get as compared to how many solo matchups you're going to get? And that all depends on how many people you have available to play with you, um, whether those are going to be normal. I think normals you can't really take very seriously um, as opposed to ranked fives. Ranked fives are probably a good measure of what's actually going to happen because in normals there's a lot of things that just you know people don't, tend to care and people will troll and things will happen that uh, tend to kind of shift the the balance. I mean, obviously, if you can get the 5v5, that's great. If you can practice 1v1 against someone of equal level or better level than you, that would actually be preferable. That's even better. But solo queue is a great general practice tool because it's almost always available to you. I guess um, our points here is play fives when you can and play solo queue when you can't play those. Yep, that's a good point. Because you know you you've brought up you brought up a lot of good points here. Yes, you can't always play fives, and you know you're gonna have to play solo queue, and then you just take whatever knowledge you've learned in both and bring it into one or the other. And I feel at my point in this game, besides trying to learn all the roles, I just I like to play competitively in fives because I feel like the game the game is better that way when you're all in vent and screaming at each other to move here and move there and <laughs> getting ghosted while you're on stream and all the good stuff. Oh. Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely a whole different flavor, and it's a more complex and interesting game when you can play in fives. Um, when you're playing with randoms, obviously, a lot more things are random, and that doesn't you know, necessarily mean it, it's going to be as much fun or be as understandable to you, but there's always things to learn. Always things to learn from why you're losing and why perhaps you got carried and so on and so forth. Um, anyways, play as much as you can. If you enjoy the game, keep playing. You will get better. Don't don't get like down in the dumps about yourself because you've had a losing streak or because you're stuck in low elo. If you do keep playing, you will get better. In addition to playing, you can read guides, watch these tournaments because all these people in tournaments are really, really good at what they do. So kind of emulate them in some respect and watch their streams on occasion and you should get better. And listen to the Trinity Force podcast every week because oh. we'll teach you how to get better. Of course. Jeez, OP. I can't believe you left that out. Read ggchronicle.com. Visit Trinity Force podcast. Watch our interviews. We got a lot of the good ones interviews over on youtube.com forward slash ggchronicle. Tom got to interview Morello. That was awesome, by the way. Morello's a really, really cool dude. It was hard to make him shut up. <laughs> it was I'm kind serious. Of, I, thought it was, I thought it was funny. I was watching the lead craft. Right before I watched yours, I watched the lead craft's interview. <laughs> and Morello actually reached out, grabbed the, guy, the guy's microphone, and put it up to his mouth and started talking. I'm like, all right, well, you just take over that interview. Yeah, Morello was really, really cool. With it. And uh, I know a lot of people uh, that listen to the podcast are probably interested on how like the champion creation process goes or what what they're trying to do with new champions coming out every so often in Season 3 and stuff and how it's going to affect. Not only pro play, but also affect like solo queue and stuff. So uh, it was a pretty good interview. You should go watch it. It was pretty so, good. It was. That's uh, wow. I, we went from being super excited in this podcast to sound like a bunch of downers now at the end of this. Uh, well, I just, I just want to play and get better, man. 
<laughs> you just gotta make yeah. plays. Play action, man. Play action. Live action. So, Tier, you're only you're only three Elo behind Odd One right now. I'm behind him. Oh that. man, what? How did that happen? Because it's funny. Because he's been before... playing for the past twelve hours. That's how it happened. <laughs> oh, I was gonna say because before he went to to Pax Prime, I was actually fifty Elo ahead of him. The last game I played, I actually carried him. I think, and and then. You know, suddenly he's ahead of me? Like, he was, like, 50 behind, and I thought he was busy tournamenting, but apparently... He's 2161 at the Oh, moment. man. He's, he's, he's been serious. Right now. Yeah. And I'll play. If you win, we'll just... Everyone will just tweet face at him for, like... Yeah. Face! <laughs> face. <laughs> I don't, I don't think he cares. He he's in. <laughs> the one thing oh. I have to say about Dyrus and Odd One, and, like, I think Jane the Broker was like, oh, well, they're not taking solo queue seriously well no one takes it too seriously but like when they're duo queuing suddenly they jump up like 200 elo but when they're solo queuing like odd one always like drops to like 1900 elo it is it's kind of ridiculous and it makes me think jungling probably isn't the best place to carry the you know the yeah. solo queue right I now think, i all. think we've known that for a long yeah. time well since they fixed the jungler like, yeah yeah that's what I and I was going to mention that earlier in the podcast. If you're trying to carry yourself out of anything, I'd say don't play the jungler. For oh the yeah, most part unless definitely unless you just like amazing with Lee Sin. Like that's like yeah. the early mid game type of carry. Lee Sin, Mundo maybe too. Like anyone who can get those early ganks. If you feel like you can demoralize the team enough from the jungle, then you can do it. But like if you're like planning on like farming and mainly just farming and trying to become a late game carry, not really the greatest role. Mm-hmm. Well. Is that it for this week's podcast? Um, I, I learned more. that Dyrus is better than Odd One at Magic the Gathering. That's important. It is very yeah. important. I, he has to carry. What was it that game. we learned like six months ago, Oslander? Who was playing Street Fighter? Oh, yeah. It was Chouster and Doublelift were playing Super Street Fighter 4. I think mm-hmm. AE or maybe just Super Street Fighter 4. And Chouster would just destroy him. <laughs> if but I read Doublelift, had- Doublelift was actually like. He, he had like I, I I mean I was I'm definitely better than him as Street Fighter or at least I was at that point I haven't seen him play in about six months, but he, his like mechanics and that were better than like, me. And I've been playing for like whatever since Street, <laughs> since Street, like, since Street Fighter two and like he was <laughs> he was hitting links I can't hit. I'm like oh that's great. I think uh, <laughs> I think just... du- I think Double Lift actually put a tweet out like a couple months ago that was like on his day off he went to like a Korean arcade and was getting rolled by Korean Vegas the entire day. He couldn't beat Vega. Vega. You mean claw? Claw. <laughs> Use the right name. Whatever. Or bison, Balrog. I guess. No, he's Balrog. Oh, he's Balrog, you're right. Uh, yeah, it is kind of confusing. Japanese, American. Whatever. This isn't Street Fighter 4. This is League of Legends. Not Dota either. Get the fuck off my podcast, Optimus Tom. Okay, bye. Somebody take us out. Give us a call at 203 494 203 You can text us at that number as well. Or send us an email, which we're receiving now. So if you send oh, us an email. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I, I totally forgot. We have, a, we have a question, a text. Oh. We didn't read it. Text. Oh. No. Uh, it's from uh, Ridley, TWR Ridley. Okay. <laughs> and this one's for Oslander. Yeah, Hopefully, Oslander has it ready. How difficult was the jungle in the Civil War compared to now? Could Minuteman <laughs> GP clear well back then? Um, yeah, you're getting your wars confused. Uh, Minutemen was the Revolutionary War and Civil War. Besides that, Gangplank used to be so broken. Um, I think it was right after DreamHack, the Season 1 Championships last year, um, when his passive would stack five times. And it was just ridiculous. Just put attack speed runes on him, and that was it. You didn't even need to build damage. Just the passive just stack. Uh, but he was great. Now he's, you can't really jungle. I mean, you can jungle him, but... It, eh not so great but he used to clear like crazy really really fun champ that was probably my favorite champ to play in my favorite time and then they nerfed him to hell but did you and did you and ben franklin used to duo queue together <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they invented the light bulb together bam <laughs> we invented we invented lightning yo <laughs> yo i think well so today I, okay. today i learned Oslander designed zara fail joke <laughs> the worst. Take us out, Oslander! Our, our podcast has lost so much steam. Yeah. I was oh, laughing on the inside. Yeah. I, I was always wondering what a joke sounded like, but I always kind of thought it would be funnier than that. <laughs> oh. oh, face. No. Um, and follow us on Twitter, T Force Podcast or GG Chronicle. So, yeah. And that's it? That's, that's it. The end. That's, all that there, that's all she wrote. 
you know, for all you Murder, She Wrote fans, back in the day, uh, only Oslander was old enough to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Horn it, too. Yeah, Horn it, too. He's not here today. We, we won't speak his name. Yeah, we so kind of forgot to mention he wasn't here. Like that. We kind of forgot to mention he wasn't here. I think people just kind of realize that we have five people on this podcast and someone is not going to be here sometime. Because I think, what, next week you have your MLG next week, aren't you? No, I don't think no. so. Oh, I thought he's the probably price gonna go to somewhere, but he won't know until like Monday night. Yeah, I won't know until Monday <laughs> night, so it doesn't really matter. You'll have to like. I will have to pay like three times the normal price for his airplane ticket. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to take a cab home for one hundred and sixty dollars. Uh, at least you have to do like four hundred dollar cab ride. Could have been, been worse. Oh, Think man. about that. The cab, the cab rides in Seattle, like the hotel for the players is like five miles away from the venue for some ungodly reason. The, ca- the taxi yeah. starts like forty dollars there. I was gonna say it's like fifty bucks to get from there to there. Blech. That's why we would just shove as many people in the cab that we could. Well, that's what, that's what we normally did. But sometimes, sometimes when you have to go out and you have to socialize and have a few drinks, you're by yourself on the way back. Oh, I'd, be I'd tell Monty to get in here and just show his ring, kiss my ring, and take. Yo, me. Monty was staying with KDH the entire time. He had like like personal like car service back and forth to KDH's house. I I had it on my own the whole weekend. I feel sorry for your bankroll. I also feel sorry for the people listening to this. So, <laughs> <laughs> Pity That's what me. I feel sorry Word for Tom's travel. Tom, how many layovers did you have in your flight? Like <laughs> seven. Oh, man. Tom, how many packs oh. Sona skins did you get us? Okay, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Podcast <laughs> over. We none of us got skins. None of you out there listening are gonna get skins from us. It's a very sad day. Well, actually, really, Monica Bristow. So any well, any listeners in Europe, you're really the ones that suffer because we just give away our uh, European skin. You know. Yeah. Willy nilly. After yeah. we redeem it on NA, we just give away the Europe ones. So. Right. <laughs> so right. in Europe, you have the right to feel aggrieved by Tom's uh, lack of dedication. Yeah, great. A whole know, Tom goes there. You. He actually he gets a Timo hat and he gives it to his brother, but he can't get us a Sona I skin. got the Timo hat from Kurtoki. He gave it to me for free. He somehow got three of them and I got zero. I don't know what the hell I'm doing wrong. Maybe I have to go nude next time. You're not using no, your mouth correctly. Don't do that. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Are you ready, Scrubs? Aye, aye, Captain! I can't hear you! Aye, aye, Captain! Who, who lives in top bushes and low elo Quit, Rose, Kate, Blake! Who's sharpened and ready and coming for you? Quit, Rose, Kate, Blake! If one hitting minions is something you wish, Quit, Rose, Kate, Blake! Leave me on just to see because my citrus delish! Quit, Rose, Kate, Blake! Ready? The Trendy Force Podcast is brought to you by ggchronicle.com. Esports news, coverage, opinion. Join the League of Legends community at ggchronicle.com.